Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. John DeYard, and welcome to LifeSpa.com, where we prove the ancient medical wisdom of Ayurveda with modern science. And welcome to today's podcast, where I have a special guest, a, a repeat guest on our podcast, um, Bob Quinn, the, the original uh, organic wheat farmer from Montana. Uh, he's a, 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 a become, I feel, a, a dear friend, mostly because I love him, and secondly, because I just read his new book, which tells his incredible story about how he became an organic farmer and how he's really used that as a platform to help many others uh, farmers become organic and actually become sustainable. Um, and really, Bob, you know, have taken this thing on from being an organic farmer who thought organic was for Californians only to really taking this on in a way where you feel where you can really feel. They give a vision for changing the world and the way we grow our food in so many ways. But let me, before I, 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 I bring you on, let me just read a quick bio of Bob. Um, he's an organic farmer near Big Sandy, Montana, uh, and a leading uh, businessman. He served on the National Organic Standards Board and has been recognized by the Montana Organic Association Lifetime and Service Award. I think you started that organization. Isn't that true? Yes. Yeah. Uh, he's the Organic Trade Association uh, Organic Leadership. He won the Organic Association um, Organic Leadership Award and the Rodale Institute's Organic Pioneer Award. His enterprises include ancient grain business Kamut, QC Kamut, or Khorasan wheat, mostly Kamut wheat. That's his thing. Uh, and it's Kamut International. And he's also created Montana's first wind farm. This guy is amazing. I, I, I'm so happy to have you back, Bob. Uh, I encourage everybody, before you read this interview, go buy this book. It's a phenomenal read. I read it when he first sent it to me. I reread it again over the last week, and I couldn't put it down. It's a story about a man who uh, was a wheat farmer in Montana, old school, and then became... Uh, got inspired to start growing organic wheat. And then that just took off like crazy. And all the things he's into, you're not going to believe. So, so, Bob, welcome. Thanks for coming back. Great. Thank you, John. It's great to be with you again. So um, my first question to you is that, you know, in your book, you said your dad started um, chemical farming back in 1955. And I was just sort of, sort of fascinated by how these farmers, you know, who were so like old school, they wanted their own seed. And it was, and all of a sudden, how did big business convince farmers to start using chemicals and pesticides? How did they buy into that? Well, right after World War II, the first herbicides became available. And um, it was like a wonder drug. Um, they had always um, fought weeds um, because they're doing very um, limited rotations lots of monoculture, the weeds were really coming in worse and worse, and um, the first uh, spray of 2,4-D just wiped them out in one pass. No one had ever seen anything like that. That was an instant buy-in, an instant um, gift they, they looked it upon. And so no one, let, me, let me ask you, so let's go back a minute. Well, before that fertilizer, there was a period of time when they were doing rotations, right? Well, when Montana was first opened up to homesteaders, it was 1914 and 1916. And um, we were so dry that they soon learned they could only grow a crop every other year. And so they had to fallow one year. So between, say, 1920 and 1945, that's only 25 years, they've only grown 12 crops, um, 12 or 13 crops. And so the natural um, nutrition in the soil is still um, carrying most of the load. And so there wasn't really um, a need yet to start thinking about um, replenishing the soil or rebuilding the soil or, or having crop rotations that would do that. And so people were just interested in what was going to um, pay the most for their uh, production. And that was wheat in this country. And that's what most people grew was wheat. Mm, By wow. the end of World War II, as I mentioned earlier, the wheat problem was uh, becoming really some years were really bad and uh, the introduction of 2,4-D herbicide was looked at as a wonder drug. The fertilizers came a couple years later and they were met with not quite as much enthusiasm because they're 
um, it was another cost and people couldn't see right away the um, um, benefits. But once people started using them and other farms started um, wearing down the soil and they really needed something to give them a boost, then they became more accepted and more adopted in the mid 50s. What was the 2,4-D? What is exactly that? What was that exactly? Well, it was an auxin. It was a herbicide that um, contained a plant auxin, which is like a hormone. It causes the plant to just kind of grow to death. And it, it was very effective on broadleaf plants. It didn't affect grass, the grass family, which was wheat. Um, so it didn't affect wheat or barley or oats. It only affected broadleaves, and most of the weeds were broadleaf plants. And that's um, why it was so effective and so um, quickly adopted. Wow, 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 wow. And then you go on in your book to say how, in like between 1950 and 1997, like 3 million farms disappeared. Between 1960 and 1970, you said 26% of the farm population disappeared. What happened? What caused that? Well, the, the policy in the country was really um, cheap and abundant food. And in order to do that, um, the policy was um, specialized, um, uh, get rid of all these extra um, projects that you're doing on the farm, like milking cows and tending chickens and um, raising pigs, at least in, in Montana. Um, everybody had their own uh, livestock. Um, that started disappearing as farms started getting bigger and machinery got bigger. And uh, with the help of all the chemicals, uh, people were able to farm more acres and they started doing that, buying out their neighbors and and the prices, when the prices would go low, their neighbors, a lot of their neighbors would go broke um, because now they started having more input costs and more, um, uh, and, and when you receive less for your wheat or less for your product, you couldn't pay your chemical bills and your other bills. And so a lot of them left and couldn't see a future in agriculture. And those that got bigger were able to make it because of low margins spread over uh, thousands of acres. Right, and that's when, you know, and you also mentioned that the government sort of forced farmers to specialize and kind of be a monocrop farm as opposed to, like you said, everybody had livestock, everybody had vegetables, like everybody was more or less sustainable and self-sufficient for, for, for a, a long period of time until, was that, I think it was 1960 or something that that started happening? Was that right? Well, it was a sort of a slow process. We had yeah. all those extra animals all the time. I was on the farm till I left for college in, in 66. <clears throat> but by the time I came back in 78, that was all gone. Right, right. Wow, wow. And then one other thing, I just going to talking about sort of the history that I thought was really mind boggling is that when the government started subsidizing farmers, I think you said the number, like they were giving around $26,000 a year for farmers, but the chemical costs for the farmers was about $26,000 a year. And the government put out this big thing, we're subsidizing the farmers, but you made the point that it really was just going into the checkbook of the farmers and then, out of, and then right out of the checkbook to the multinational corporation. So it was really a subsidy for big multinational chemical corporations, right? That's right. And that, those numbers from for our farm, we were farming about 1,200 acres of land at that point, And that was about our cost of chemicals. And that was about our, our government check. The government checks certainly um, were tied to the size of the farms. So the bigger the farms, the more money you got. So they were really um, uh, pushing the um, advantage of having bigger and bigger farms, but bigger and bigger government subsidies. Right, right. And then, and then um, I guess from the very beginning, it was really, you know, the government's motive was really supporting the big, companies, not so much the farmer, right? Because it was a pass-through entity going right to the big co companies. And, you know, you guys ended up paying the big price, right? Well, right. And the, and the big goal was cheap food. And yeah. so everybody paid a price for cheap food. We don't pay it at the checkout counter. But the farmers are the first one to pay the price for cheap food by not really getting a fair price for what they're selling. Right, right. And then also... Um, you've had to deal with a lot of adversity like climate change. I'm really curious to know what your take is on that up there. How, how, how have things changed? Well, you know, there's a lot of debate sometimes about climate change in this uh, country. I tell my friends that farmers don't have, have the opportunity or the privilege to sit and debate it because we have to respond to it. It's already happening to us. And what we're seeing generally in our areas that 
The summers are coming quicker. The rain is stopping sooner and it's getting hotter sooner. And so our spring crops are more and more at risk. Uh, and what, we're, what I'm trying to do on our farm is turn to more fall seeded crops, which <clears throat> are still able to um, uh, be harvested, mature and be harvested before the rains really quit uh, during their growing period when they really need the rain. And so we're experimenting with traditionally spring seeded crops that we're planting in the fall, like barley, for example, um, like safflower, and um, seeing if we can't um, move our spring crops into a little lower risk area by planting them in the fall. That's one of the things we're doing. We're looking at more winter hardy crops too. Is that sort of the natural way of a lot of like, the, the, I guess the grasses, right? They seed in the fall, the seed falls, and then they, they would, I would imagine, germinate in that latter part of summer, or, and then they would grow through the winter. Is that how it works? Or, well, uh, for winter wheat, what we call winter wheat, we plant in September, and then it will grow in about six weeks until it gets so cold that it doesn't grow any longer. And then in the spring, it's already rooted down and it's ready to go. It, it uh, starts growing as soon as the weather warms up. But when you have spring wheat and barley and oats, which are mostly spring seeded crops, you have to work the ground when it warms up. Um, when the weeds start growing for organic farmers particularly, we have to work the ground, kill the weeds, and then we plant the crop sometime in April or late April or early May. And meanwhile, the winter wheat or the fall seeded crops have a, a six week jump on the uh, spring seeded crops, four to six weeks. It makes quite a difference. So is the, is the winter wheat and the spring wheat different wheat or is it just wheat, same wheat you're planting at different times? No, it's different. It's different wheat. They have different uh, genetic makeups. They have different um, winter hardiness um, factors. So that most of the time, if you plant spring wheat in the fall, it'll winter kill. And if you plant winter wheat in the spring, it needs a cold vernalization, it's called, to trigger the heading process when it heads out and flowers and produces grain. If it doesn't get that, it just stools, or it just grows in the grass state. And so if you plant winter wheat in the spring, you won't get anything. So, so what is camu? They're very different. What is camu? What are the ancient grains? Are they all winter wheat or are they? Well, it depends where you are. Um, uh, the camu uh, coruscant that we grow uh, around the Mediterranean and in Southern California and Arizona can be planted in the fall because it can survive the real mild winters that they have there. Um, as you go further north, uh, where we are, we have to plant it in the spring because it doesn't survive the winter. So what I'm doing now is looking at different Coruscant lines from all over the world and seeing if I can find some winter hardy ones, which can increase the stability and the um, lessen the risk of the crop for us. Right. So, so what you're saying then is that the, the many different ancient grain strains of wheat, there are many different types. And in, in, in the Kamut or the Coruscant wheat, because it was Mediterranean, it, it now becomes more of a spring wheat. But there are, how about einkorn and those, are they winter um, strains and more hardy? Or how does well, that some work? Um, some of them are, are winter and some are spring. And some are what's called facultative, which means that they can uh, be planted in either the fall or the spring. Um, like red five, which is quite common from Canada. That can also be planted as a winter wheat for us, uh, rather than just a spring wheat. And the Coruscant um, lines that I'm looking at from all over the world, some of those are, are quite winter hardy. So right. I'm seeing with the, with the um, ancient grains, there's more uh, diversity in that. Some of them, uh, it's not so clear cut. Some are definitely clear cut, they're either winter or spring, but others can be either. And so that's a little more of, um, of a uh, vari variability. So yeah. it was really, de depending on where the grain was grown originally, you know, geographically, you're saying that, that there may have been, you know, harvests in the late summer and there may be harvests in the spring, depending on where you were historically in the ancestral grains that were there. Yes. yes. And, and probably as they evolved, they became either more winter hardy or, or more spring type, if that's all they were <clears throat> used for, for example. Wow, wow. Okay, so, so we know that your story was, you, some guy gave you some King Tut wheat and told you that the grain was from King Tut tomb, turned out not to be really the case. So, um, you know, tell us the story of Camu. I think people would love to hear that. Well, when I was a kid in high school, I went to the county fair and I um, was just 
looking around as usual at the sites at the fair. And this old fellow uh, was um, called me over to him and said, hey, Sonny, he says, would you like some of King Tut's wheat? And so I went over and so I said, sure. And he poured a handful in my hand and there was a giant wheat. You know, I was raised on a wheat farm. I'd never seen wheat like this. It was three times the size of our normal wheat. And he claimed it came out of a tomb in Egypt. And that it had been sent to Shoto County, where I live in Montana, um, in the early 50s, um, by a uh, by a pilot, a uh, Air Force man, in stationed in Portugal. He um, ran into a fellow at a bar and who had just come back from Egypt and claimed to have taken this out of a tomb. <clears throat> Gave him about 30 or 40 kernels. He sent it to his dad in Montana, and it grew. And it was just a novelty. People didn't. It didn't make really uh, the American style of bread, so it wasn't used for that. Um, they didn't really know what to do with it. So they just grew this anomaly and gave it away at the fairs and the neighbors. And it was very tall, uh, as most ancient grain is, um, and had a nice, it looked nice. It had a nice color and a nice look. And that's, that's all it amounted to. And, and for me, that was the same. <clears throat> it was just a novelty. And when I was in uh, UC Davis finishing my graduate program there in about 877. Um, I was reading the back of a package of corn nuts and said, corn nuts made with a giant corn. And I thought, ah, oh, I wonder if these guys would be interested in a giant wheat. And so I called them up and I said, oh, we might be interested in that. So I called my dad back and I said, dad, see if you can find some of that old King Tut's wheat. And um, so in a couple, well, less than a week, he called me back and said, well, I found a jar full, about a pint jar half full, sent me a couple of tablespoons. And I sent that to corn nuts and they said, this makes a fantastic snack. I said, we'll take 10,000 pounds. And I said, well, I didn't really have 10,000 pounds. I, I didn't want to tell him I only had a pint or less. And, but I called my dad right away and I said, dad, plant that whole thing right in the garden. And so we started planting it and we sent it to California and grew it over the winter. So we had two crops a year until we had about 50 pounds. And when I called back to corn nuts, they said, oh, we don't, the guy that was in, doing the experiments had left. No one was interested in it. And so it just kind of went by the wayside. And we put our 50 pounds in the shed, and there it sat for two or three, about five years, I guess, until we went to our first health food show in California. And um, my dad was passing around and showing everybody. And one person, after three days, and thousands of people went by, one person said, oh, that's just what I'm looking for. He was a, had a macrobiotic store in San Diego and uh, gold mine natural. It was called, and um, because of that, we planted all 50 pounds, and that was in um, 76, uh, or I mean 86, and then 30 years later, we planted half an acre in 86, and 30 years later, we had 100,000 acres under cultivation that we, that we um, contracted with organic farmers in Montana, Alberta, and Saskatchewan, and we were selling it all over the world. And then somewhere along the way, because the original Camut, we grew it originally, it wasn't organic. This was even before the demand for organic really happened. But tell us the story of how you, you kind of figured out that they, these guys wanted organic and you had to kind of change everything. Well, it was actually uh, two stories going on at once. Um, that same year that we planted the half acre um, in 86, I, I was my first experiment with organic production on our farm. We planted 20 acres in organic. <clears throat> and it was such a uh, terrific success that I was almost an immediate convert. And within two years, I had converted my whole farm, which is 2,400 acres to organic. Um, and that was coinciding. And by the, the time I had done that, I'd become a real believer in organic and uh, really want to promote it all I could. And from that time on, that's all we ever grew is organic. And that's what I wanted to commute. The commute commu is a trademark that we registered that means um, wheat in ancient Egyptian because we thought it was from ancient Egypt originally. Um, and we trademarked, we registered that trademark. And that trademark has guarantees. And the guarantee was that it was always organically grown, never mixed with modern wheat and the high protein. So, so where is it from? The Camus. Well, Mesopotamia. Um, when I went to, to Turkey, we were doing some experiments there, and the, the people I was working with said, oh, well, we know this grain. They said, we call it camel's tooth or the prophet sweet. I said, well, that's interesting. I can see why you call it camel's tooth because it's kind of big on one end, small on the other, and, and bent shaped like a tooth, maybe you'd think. 
But I said, why do you call it the prophet suite? And they said, I said, does it have something to do with Muhammad? Because it was Turkey, you know, they're quite Muslim there. And they said, oh, no, no, not that prophet. They said, you know, the one with the boat. And I said, boat? I said, do you mean Noah? Oh, yeah, this is the grain Noah brought with him on the ark. And I said, wow. I said, that's a lot better story than my old tomb story. Yeah, and right. So, you just upgraded the story, yeah. That's right. <laughs> but anyway, that's the origin of it in that area of the world of Mesopotamia. Um, and uh, it's still called Camel Tooth in Palestine in, in Israel, where I found it here a few years ago, growing in just small plots. Um, it survived because farmers like the taste of it. And it really didn't become commercially, but well, it, sh it was shoved out, I should say, by the modern wheats when commercial and industrial agriculture came to this region of the world, to Egypt with the building of that high dam and the irrigation that resulted in that. They couldn't afford to raise these low yielding grains anymore. So they were all dispensed with. But people kept growing them in small patches for their own use because they liked the taste and, and how they felt when they ate the grain. Does it, it's not a bread making grain, is it? Well, it depends what kind of bread you're making. Um, Tell me it's, about not, it. it's not a wonder bread type making grain. <laughs> but if you're making. But it's wonderful, bread, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a wonderful bread making grain, right? Not wonder bread, yeah. So if you're making sourdough and, and um, artisan breads, that's not just uh, rising up like um, air bread that we know and love in America. It'll do fine with that. You just have to treat it different. Um, in India, they, it's a very close relative to durum. In India, they use durum all the time to make chapati. And if you make this grain into chapatis, it'll, it'll act just like durum. It'll, it'll work just fine. So you have to, rather than force the grain to um, uh, go into the mold that you have preconceived, that it should, like, like air bread from America, you have to really see what it can do by itself. And you can make wonderful bread with it. It's just not going to look like um, wonder bread, that's all. It's a, it's a land race, which means it's that it was naturally or it was selected by farmers to get this particular strain. Is that what that means? Is that right? Well, land race it means it's not a pure strain. It's not a pure line. <clears throat> so when the farmers would collect wheats in the wild and they would plant them and, and, and sort of by category, they always um, collected a, a variety of, of strains which made up the same line. And a lot of times those strains would have different um, resistance to disease, to insects, and even to uh, how they grew uh, competing with weeds. And so uh, particularly with, with insects and a disease, if a certain disease moved in and wiped out 20% that was susceptible to that, you still had 80% that wasn't, or vice versa. And so the idea was that you didn't have a monoculture. You had a land race. You had a diverse um, population that had different um, susceptibilities or resistance to disease and insects and would therefore survive if something unpredicted came up or even like a, a cold snap. These are really important for the kind of weather that we have now, besides the things I mentioned earlier with climate change. Another way to, to adapt to it or to respond to it is by planting um, uh, mixtures of populations that have different resistance to cold or heat or, or wet or dry and that sort of thing. So if you have an extreme weather event, hopefully you'll have um, sur enough survivors that fill in for those that are destroyed you still have a crop. Isn't that completely the opposite concept of GMO? Isn't it all monocrop? Isn't it all the same strain? You know, It's a completely that... opposite in concept from industrial agriculture. Industrial agriculture is built with the idea that your farm is a factory and everything is controlled. And as you well know, most people know, um, uh, a farm is uh, a living organism. It's part of nature. And you can't control hardly anything with it because um, things are, uh, are not controlled. They're, they're variable. They vary with the climate. They vary with the temperatures and the rainfall and everything. Um, varies and so that's why diversity is so important and because you can um, hedge your bets against this variability <clears throat> where the idea with industrial agriculture is that with chemicals or high technology you can um, have the crutches you need to get by and produce big crops so where do we stand now in terms of you know 
like you said, industrial farming, you know, is how fragile is our food supply if everything is just one crop, one strain, there's lacking diversity in terms of the soil, in terms of, I guess, the microbiome in the soil must be affected by that. The plants become more vulnerable. Um, where do we stand? Is it, is it, you know, with climate changing as it is, is the uh, food supply more at risk than we know? Oh, I think so. And so are our soils. Um, we haven't really talked about this much, but the, um, this, the enormous spraying of glyphosate is also affecting our soils. Glyphosate is a antibacterial, it's an antibody and it, or, or antibiotic, and it will kill bacteria, not only weeds, but it kills bacteria, not only in the soil, but also our gut. That's why it's important that we're not eating it even in trace amounts. So we're pouring chemicals on to produce an artificial system that is geared to everything being predictable and almost perfect to produce these big crops. But if you remember back, um, if people look up in their history, in 1970 we had the uh, corn blight um, affected this country because we had so much of the corn was just one variety. And a new blight appeared and went through and devastated the crop that year. and, and cause a big um, loss and a big decrease in the supply. And that can happen again. And that's why having uh, um, less resiliency in your cropping system is so um, putting yourself at really high risk. Wow. Wow. That's, that's incredible. And then, of course, the, uh, the idea of GMO not having the farmers have access to their own seed um, is another concept I'd like for you to comment on. And I also love your philosophy when you started um, partnering up with other farmers, how you handle the seed. So talk to me about first the GMO seed or lack of seed issue, and then how you handle seed, pretty much opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah, it, well, it is. I study Monsanto a lot and I try to do everything just the opposite that they do. And I feel <laughs> like I'm pretty safe ground doing that. But to me, GMOs are just a one step further into the industrialization process of control. And the idea that uh, the farm's a factory and you can control everything. Now we've extended the control to the seed and the farmers are not even able to keep their own seed anymore. They're not able to keep it with hybrids either. So it's not an entirely uh, new concept, but it's another advancement into the same model, uh, making it even more rigid or more tight. So now farmers are forced not only to buy the seed, but the chemicals that are required to raise that crop with that seed. So more and more control is being relinquished by the farmer to the chemical companies. And I, and I, I compare it to the days of surfatum. Um, you know, when the surfs, the only difference is now the farmers own their own land, but by and large, um, at least in, in this area. Uh, the castle's gone. Um, so we don't have that protection right around us. We don't have really any protection. Uh, what we're doing is exporting our wealth out of state to multinational corporations. And now Monsanto's just been bought by Bayer in, in Germany. <clears throat> and so it's not even an American corporation anymore, uh, even though it was a multinational, but now it's a, a, a German corporation that we're sending our money to. And uh, draining the heartland of, um, of America by these uh, enormous bills that are created by um, high cost for high-tech seed and the chemicals that go to, to produce the crops with them. So what we're trying to do is just opposite of that. So we don't charge the farmers at all for our seed. We, we give it to them in, um, and ask for it to be returned at harvest time. So we're not making money off of the farmers and charging big amounts of money for seed. And um, <clears throat> although we don't, uh, we offer the seed to the farmers at, at the same cost as they return it to us. Um, if they can, and some farmers want to save their own seed, and if they're able to keep the quality equal to the quality that we demand and the quality our customers expect, we allow that too. Um, <clears throat> if, if their seed has been contaminated or a little bit um, mixed with any, uh, with barley or modern wheat or anything like that, then we make sure that we were replacing that. So we always have the highest quality of seed possible. Wow. So you mentioned glyphosate and before we leave that subject. Um, you know, I just wondered, you know, how much of the use of glyphosate is still being used as a desiccant on 
on wheat. Obviously, generally speaking, farmers don't spray glyphosate on their wheat crop, right? But they will use it because it's not a GMO product, but they will use it as a desiccant. So I'm curious, well, one, do they just use the Roundup for everything anyway as a, as a pesticide? And are they still using it as a desiccant to kill the wheat early? How do you talk to well, me about there that? There is probably more of the use of desiccant the further north you went. People were anxious to get their crops terminated and harvested, dried out before snowfall, particularly in Canada. Um, the Canadians ran into a real problem with um, the Italians shutting off their Durham, um, which is a big uh, crop for Canada. This is not organic. Now we're talking about non-organic stuff. And, um, and now most farmers are having to sign affidavits that they are not using Roundup as a desiccant uh, in order to re recapture those markets in Italy at least. Um, oh, they wouldn't sell it to farmers who were using the Roundup. That's why they stopped. They said, well, they wouldn't buy the farmer's grain if they had used Roundup as a desiccant. Oh, I see. They wouldn't send it back, right. I see. They wouldn't yeah. buy it from the farmer, so the farmers are left holding the bag. And, um, but in Montana and in other states, of course, with Roundup is also be used with some crops because of, of GMO, they're Roundup ready, which means that they can be resistant to Roundup. And so every other plant will die in the field except the Roundup resistant GMO plant. And then that's been done with soybeans and, and corn and um, lots of different crops. And so the, that's increased the use of Roundup tremendously. In Montana, we don't have Roundup ready wheat, but it's used as chem fallow. So as I mentioned earlier, half the um, land in Montana, most of the cropping area in the, in the east, in the plains, remains fallow for one year and then crop the next year. So we can conserve moisture and have enough moisture to raise the second year's crop. And to do that, they used to cultivate the ground to um, uh, kill the weeds. But now they use Roundup, um, it's called chem fallow. And so they spray the Roundup on the field, on the standing stubble from the previous year. And so the stubble is still covering the ground, which is a good thing. But the use of the multiple passes of Roundup, Roundup is a bad thing. Because now we're not only poisoning the soil, but we're seeing um, glyphosate resistant weeds, which are now creating a need for even more harsh chemicals and more spraying all the time to kill these resistant weeds. So it's just a vicious cycle. Wow, wow. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, um, gluten intolerance and, you know, why Kamut and ancient grains are, and I think, and in, in, in how the, the, the grain is processed into a, a wheat-based product that makes a difference in terms of how people can tolerate the wheat? Well, I think that there's four main factors in, with wheat. Now, let me speak to wheat because that's what I know most about and that's what I grow. And when I've discovered that up to 20%, 12 to 20% of the people in this country no longer could eat wheat without some kind of difficulty, that was quite a, a shock to me. I was frustrated, embarrassed, and angry all at the same time because I was a wheat grower. And now all of a sudden, yeah. my product isn't acceptable to 20% of the people that I would like to sell it to. This is, um, this is a, a, um, a bad situation, I thought. And I would think that there would be more effort by plant breeders to try to figure out what's going on or, or anybody to figure out what's going on. But, norm, but mo by and large, people who have had this problem have been ignored or, or been told it's all in their head and it's not really real. Um, but it is real for a lot of people. And so what I've done is tried to understand what's been changed because for 10,000 years, people ate wheat. It was the staff of life from biblical times. And the, the, the really the source of food and energy and vitality for the greatest civilizations known in the Western man, sorry, the Babylonians, the Ephesians, the, the Greeks, the Romans, the, the uh, Egyptians. And now what's happened in the last 50 years has changed all that. You can't say it's wheat. Um, um, in its, in its uh, original form, at least. But you can look at all the changes we've made. And first of all, how we grow it. So now we are very chemically industrial oriented and applying large amounts of, of fertilizers and, and pesticides to our crops. Um, and then how we process it. We are now milling the 
the grain and making white flour. That's not really new. That's been going on for 100 years. But it's also a huge, taking away a huge portion of the nutrition from wheat. Um, that's probably not responsible for wheat sensitivities, but it's reducing nutritional value. So we're losing there. Um, we have plant breeders now changing the wheat in breeding programs to make it shorter, to make it more disease resistant, to make it more able to respond better to higher doses of, of um, fertilizers particularly. So it can grow faster, it can produce more bushels, more pounds, more tons per acre. And lastly, and probably the biggest change is at the bakeries. The bakeries <clears throat> demanded the plant breeders to give them wheat that they could use to make more loaves of bread with less flour. And by doing that, they changed the gluten so it would be more elastic and hold more air. <clears throat> and by doing that, they, they measure low volumes to do this. So they get bigger and bigger low volumes for less and less wheat. That means you can sell air for the price of bread. This is a great thing for a baker. And, um, and no one imagined that there would be a problem with this. And yet, because they changed the gluten, many people started having problems digesting this gluten. And the last thing that really compounded that was the use of fast-rising yeast for, by the bakers. And the bakeries now are using fast-rising yeast. It only um, is allowed the time to, to um, ferment the sugar that they add to the dough, uh, which wasn't traditionally added, but now they add sugar. And that sugar is broken down to, to alcohol, which, which uh, gases off, and carbon, when you bake it, and carbon dioxide, which forms the gas, which raises the bread. And um, then as soon as the bread is high enough, it goes into the oven a very short, in a very short time. If you contrast that with long fermentation, such as sourdough, um, you know, you're pre-digesting with sourdough and uh, breaking down gluten, even problem problematic gluten, in a 48 hours um, fermentation period, 97% of all that gluten is gone. It's pre-digested, it's broken down, and people eating that are far less likely to have trouble. So all those factors have gone together to create this perfect storm, which is the problem of wheat sensitivities. By and large, probably 95, 96% of what the trouble is can be traced to those four things. So um, people, um, they go to Europe and they say, I can eat the bread over there, but I can't eat the bread over here. How do you explain that? Well, look at the European bread. It's not air bread. <laughs> it's, it's much denser. Their mm -hmm. grain hasn't been bred to make that kind of air bread that we have in America so that you know that the gluten probably hasn't been changed as much. There's a lot more sourdough. Or just, I was just talking about the importance of sourdough, pre-digesting the uh, gluten in the, in the starch so it makes it easier to finish the digestion process when you eat it. Right. Uh, those, right. uh, and and there's, less, um, there's less chemical use. There's certainly... Um, there's more organic, but they're probably not all eating organic over there. That's not the only thing. But that also is all contributing because there's less chemical use. There's less chemical contamination. We've got Roundup glyphosate in our rain now. So we're getting traces of glyphosate starting to contaminate everything in this country. And glyphosate on wheat um, affects the, uh, for some, for many people, affects the digestive system in a way that they recognize as wheat sensitivity but it's actually glyphosate that's causing problems with the bacteria, which then set off a chain of reaction that causes people to feel bad. Yeah, literally, literally the, the glyphosate kills the bacteria that make the enzymes like DPP-4 that literally break down gluten. So when you take any pesticide, you know, you kill a, a bug on food, you're, you're killing the bugs that make the enzymes inside of us to cook and digest that food. So. It's just, a, you know, obviously a really bad idea. When you and I were young, you go to a baker and they were up really early every day and they would make bread. And by the end of the day, by six o'clock at night, the bread was hard and they were giving it away. Yeah. yeah. How is it today? Right. You know, how is it today now that the bake, the bread can stay on the shelf for a month or two or three and stay soft and squishy? And yeah. not only does the Wonder Bread do that, all the bread in the grocery stores stays nice and squishy for you for, for it seems yeah. like ever. Yeah, and that's another point we haven't even talked about, the preservatives that are added. Um, some of the preservatives also make it hard to digest. 
And in Europe, I talked about the difference between Europe. People are buying bread fresh much more than we are. And that's yeah. and one of the ways they do, or one of the reasons they do that is they're not using so many preservatives. And so that's yeah. another factor in the whole um, wheat sensitivity discussion. And one of the main preservatives are the, the, the highly processed, and we want to talk about this next with you, which you did, the highly processed polyunsaturated fatty acids, the canola oil, sunflower oil, you know, that they put into these breads that have been bleached and boiled and deodorized, cooked to 450 degrees, and rendered them completely impalatable to any microbe or bug. They put that in the loaf of bread. The, the bugs won't eat it on the counter. When you put it in your mouth, the bugs won't eat it inside of you. So where does all that bad oil go? It goes to your liver, congests your liver and your gallbladder. And we have today the number one abdominal surgery in America today is a gallbladder removal surgery. And you need your gallbladder to buffer the acid that your stomach needs to, to cook and make enough acid to break down gluten and the other hard to digest proteins in bread. So by doing that, it just completely you know, um, unravels our ability to digest anything hard to digest, which is all about when I wrote my book, Eat Wheat, was all kind of about, hey, eat really good whole wheat, which you're talking about, but I'm all saying we gotta fix the broken down digestion that's there as well, which is a really important piece of the puzzle. Now you also did a lot of research um, uh, oh, let's, let's talk about the safflower thing. I thought that was just a beautiful story about how and why you ended up growing high oleic safflower oil. So tell me that story. Well, my original idea was to grow our own fuel. And yeah. so I started with camelina oil with the idea of making biodiesel. And once I started really investigating that, there's so many problems with biodiesel and small, and, and small production that I just gave up on that. Um, and then uh, in traveling to Germany, I found people there that were using straight vegetable oil uh, in diesel engines without making biodiesel. In America, they told me you couldn't do that. But in Germany, they were already doing it. And in fact, um, the diesel engines started out on uh, being built for vegetable oil, not for diesel. And so it's a, it fits it very fine. But you have to have a certain type of, of oil that is monounsaturated. That means it only has one double bond, and that can be utilized by a diesel engine straight and, and work fine as long as it's preheated. That's the only difference that you have to do. And um, so we gave up on camelina because it wasn't, um, it was a polyunsaturated oil, not monounsaturated. And we went to high oleic safflower because safflower is something we can grow. We can't grow canola or sunflowers or other oils or flax here very successfully, but we can grow safflower well. So that's why I focused on high oleic safflower. And one of my hired men took it to town and uh, to the um, restaurant and the guy said, man, this makes the best French fries and, and tasting, uh, great tasting chicken. And, and then I started doing some studies on it and found that it's high oleic because it's a monounsaturated, it's very stable and really the best kind of oil for high temperature cooking because it doesn't break down the trans fats. Um, it's also good for your heart. And um, so we started selling it to restaurants uh, and they loved it. And then we, I thought, that, well, why don't I get the waste oil and see if we can use waste oil on our tractor. So we started collecting the waste oil then, cleaning it, just dewatering it, um, filtering it down to about 10 microns, and then we put it in our tractor. So we're able to sell it twice, which really helps the bottom line, and also is a, a complete cycle, a complete circle. So what we're growing on the farm, we're bringing it back to the farm and helping reduce the carbon footprint in an enormous way by doing that. Wow, what an incredible model for, for farmers, really, you know. And I'm sure no matter where you live, there's got to be some type of oil-producing plant that can yes. do the same thing. Because you can have high oleic sun, sunflowers, high oleic um, canola. And the other thing, we're pressing this oil on our farm with, with um, a cold, uh, a cold, using cold presses. That means that we just press it. It doesn't get much more than 100 degrees, 105 or so. We don't uh, deodorize it. We don't... Um, uh, decolorize it. We don't extract the last bit from the from the leftover mash um, by uh, hexane and other extraction chemicals that are really not good for you at all, but are used commonly industrial um, in industrial purposes. And yet they say it's safe. Well, it's really not safe at all. So we are not using any of that. And, and the oil comes out very yellow, full of vitamin E and other vitamins and minerals that are really good for you that are extracted out of most of the vegetable oils that you see in your 
on your um, uh, in the counter in the in the food store. So once again, we've over processed, and you mentioned it yourself. We've over processed, we've over um, industrialized all the system just to make it cheap. And I keep telling anyone who listen to me that there's a very high cost of cheap food. And you just you rattled off uh, some of it right there with the gallbladder um, operations and all this sort of stuff. Yeah, all the medical problems are high cost of cheap food. Absolutely. So, so the difference between high oleic safflower and the safflower you buy in the grocery store, are they two different plants, two different, what's the difference? Well, you need to look at the label and see if it's, um, it's either high oleic or uh, the, most of the original safflower oil was not high oleic and had polyunsaturated um, uh, component that made most of it. And that safflower is now mostly used for bird seed, and that's where it should go. Uh, you shouldn't you shouldn't cook with it. It's not stable enough to cook with, and it's it's less healthy. But and it's uh, a different plant. No, it's not a different plant. It's been the high oleic. Well, it's a different um, line. It's a different. Um, it's still a safflower plant, but it's right. been bred. The high oleic has been selected not by GMO or anything, but just by looking and finding kernels that have undergone natural mutations and are producing high oleic um, acid as their main component of that oil. And that's what has been developed by plant breeders in eastern Montana. Wow. So you can literally go and buy seed that's high oleic uh, safflower and you can buy seed that's low or just polyunsaturated fatty acid safflower oil. There's two different seeds. For yeah. The linoleic is the uh, non uh, high oleic, it's either linoleic or oleic, is predominating in the sapphire plant. <clears throat> and the oleic is the same oil that makes olive oil so wonderful, and olive oil is a monounsaturate. So it's really um, sort of an olive oil kind of you know, alternative, <laughs> right? Just oh, like yeah. they were trying to do with canola. Yeah. We think it's better than olive oil, but that's because I grow it, of course, and we can't grow all these trees in Montana. <laughs> but um, I mean, if I was in Italy, I'd eat olive oil, but I don't live in Italy. I, 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 I think that we would be best, John, looking around us and eating predominantly what is grown locally and the type of plants that grow locally. Those type of plants that are grown locally are providing, by and large, what we need for the climate, for the uh, nature of, of where we're living. And it's, it's okay if you want to have treats, you know, like bananas shipped around the world, but by and large, I believe most of your diet should really come from what's grown locally, and, and at least in your region. And eat, eat regionally, and you'll be in better, in better health, I believe. Well, you know, some of the stuff, the research I've done and written about is that, you know, the, the bugs in the soil change the microbes from one season to the next. Mm -hmm. The microbes on the plants change from one season to the next. Mm -hmm. Our gut, new research shows that our gut microbiome changes, should change, doesn't with most, you know, cheap foods that we eat should change from one season to the next. So it only makes logical sense that we would naturally, that the soil would provide on that food the microbiome that would be specific to protect you from the adversity of that environment. Like they did a study where they had deer and the deer ate uh, bark in the winter and they had microbes for digesting bark in the winter and then the deer ate leaves in the summer. They had different microbes for digesting leaves in the summer, but if the deer were to, they were to give the deer bark in the summer, they'd have the wrong microbes, and it could cause such a level of indigestion, it could kill the deer. Yes. So deer potentially die when they eat out of season. So in a similar way, I think what you're saying is it's, you know, and I, I'm a big fan of seasonal food and, and really understanding that, boy, the more food you can get out of your own garden, you're getting those microbes from that ground that is specific to the environment to help protect you from the extremes of that environment. Does that make sense? I think so. Yeah, that's a good... That's a good uh, window of understanding to open on that subject. So you also dabbled and still are dabbling with growing foods without any irrigation at all, which blew my mind when I read that in your book. I'm like, so I, tell me about that. I want to know what I should grow down here in Colorado. <laughs> well, I think if you look at what's happening in California, um, the next big um, uh, crisis is going to be the water crisis. That's yeah. going to make the fuel crisis look like Disneyland in, in, in the comparison. 
and it's already started just in bits and pieces. Um, and when you have millions and millions of people living in huge cities, and there's a choice of between dumping water on um, on a uh, field of almonds or, a, or an almond grove or a, or a field of tomatoes, and um, and sending it to the cities who are uh, drying up, you can, we don't need to to imagine who's going to win that that uh, debate and, and uh, get the water. And so yeah. I think it really behooves us to, for us who are living in the dry west, or yeah. semi-arid west, we have thousands and thousands of acres, John, and we can grow more than wheat on. And um, when the homesteaders first came out, they had gardens out in the prairie. <clears throat> Most of that's been lost um, people don't do that anymore but i was interested to really understand how much we could really grow on the prairie without irrigation and so i've been just planting seeds without watering them at all we get about 12 to 14 inches of rainfall um 40 percent of that comes in may and june and that's the main water they get because in july and august it quits raining and what i've seen if i space my plants give them about three times more space than what you'd plant for irrigated or in your garden or, or in areas of the country where it actually rains so they don't even have to water their grass. Um, they, those individual plants will survive quite well. And each of those plants will produce nearly the amount of, um, of fruit that the um, plants that are irrigated will produce. But I only have one third as many. So I, right away my production is only one third. But still, we've got thousands of acres. It doesn't really matter. Um, we reduce the cost of that production. We have a lot of costs in labor, of course, um, but we don't have any costs in irrigation. And the intensity of the flavors are really amazing. Um, even tomatoes. Uh, I didn't expect tomatoes to grow dry land. I can't grow all the varieties very successfully, but the mid-sized to small tomatoes just do great. The very biggest tomatoes don't do as well. Um, I haven't had as good of luck with um, um, uh, with oh some of the brassicas with uh, like um, Brussels sprouts or um, uh, those sorts of things. They're, they're so strong when you concentrate the flavors. They're so strong they're hardly edible. <laughs> and, uh, um, and yet when you concentrate the flavors of tomato, it's really quite pleasant and. The thing that I was most surprised, so we're doing mostly storage vegetables to start with, like potatoes and onions and winter squash. And now we've expanded into all kinds of vegetables, the sweet corn, uh, uh, watermelon, which I never imagined. But when I went to um, Israel, they told me watermelon is more, it's a desert plant. It, it really will thrive on low water. Um, and so yeah, you I, said you were, when you were a kid, watermelons got about that big and then are you telling me now without watering them, you get big sized ones? Yeah, it was 25 to 30 pounds last year. Another thing that's adding to that, of course, is the climate change. We're getting more heat in the summer than we used to, and watermelon loves heat, and that really makes them thrive. At the, at the uh, height of the summer last year, when we had 100, over 100 degrees for about nearly eight or 10 days in a row, the watermelon leaves were the only leaves I had in my um, experimental dryland plot that weren't wilting and all the rest of the plants wilted at midday at least under that heat. The watermelons didn't wilt. It was amazing. They really um, can suck up the water and, and their leaf structures are such that they can stand the heat and they thrive in it. And yeah, because they're like really big, right? And the watermelon stays underneath it, right? Well, the leaves didn't cover, my leaves weren't so dense, they covered the watermelon, but I'm talking about the leaves on the plants, not, <clears throat> not so much the fruit, but compared to the leaves on my corn were wilting, the leaves on my tomatoes were wilting, the, the uh, pumpkins, all the squash were all wilting in midday. They didn't die, though. No, they didn't die, but they would wilt. You know, they, they weren't perky looking, um, like they had lots of water. They were under stress. Um, and another thing is plants often do better when they're under stress. And I think that they make a uh, uh, higher quality, nutritious food when they're under stress. So that's not all bad. I'm going to stress out my garden and see how that goes. <laughs> well, you know. by degrees, John. Don't, don't <laughs> be too extreme. Don't turn the water off, right? <laughs> okay. Um, I want to wrap up talking a little, go back into the gluten thing and, and, um, and talk about... Um, you know, and I, I have a hard time with this too, because 
you know, I wrote a book called Eat Wheat. I'm all about, hey, you're blaming the wrong thing. It's not wheat. It's how we process it. It's the pesticides. It's bad digestion. It's all these preservatives we put in the food. But now we have, you know, because people still can't digest it, people are telling us that we shouldn't eat, you know, wheat or grains or nuts or seeds or beans or legumes or anything with an anti-nutrient or a lectin on it, like the best-selling book out now, David, uh, Dr. Gundry's book, uh, The Plant Paradox, where he says all lectins are poisonous. And I try to make the case in my articles that these poisons, these anti-nutrients are the irritants and the stimulators for gut immunity. And when you just take out all the hard to digest stuff out that we evolved to eat and having a gut immunity as a result of, you end up in situations where you watch people's immune systems becoming more and more compromised, which I've written articles about that's in fact the case. Um, so the science is there saying that taking the hard to digest stuff out of the diet is a really bad idea. Um, but, you know, there are things like lectins and, you know, wheat germ and glutens that they call poisonous, which although I found science showed that they can actually be used for leukemia and treating cancer. So, so every time I find an, an article saying this is, these lectins and these phytic acids are terrible for you, I go find studies that show that they're, that they're used in medicinal situations for cancers and intestinal issues as well. So um, I'm a believer that, that we need some of that irritating, those irritants in our food to keep us stronger and resilient for a crazy changing world, which seems to be getting crazier. But I wonder what your take is on the whole lectin thing and how now it's like, you know, weed has just become like there's lectins, it's just bad and everybody should just get away from all that, which I think is just a, a really dangerous road to hope. Well, I go back to my story I repeated earlier it's saying how wheat builds civilizations, uh, some of the greatest civilizations for 10,000 years and it certainly wasn't killing off the population. They were they were um, not only surviving, but thriving with this kind of diet for thousands of years, John. So I can't imagine that they were eating poison all that time. But I can imagine that under today's scenario, and many of the things you mentioned, when we've changed the way we grow it, we change the way we process it, we change the way we bread it, we change, um, uh, we have contaminations now on it, that we aren't eating the same product that our ancestors ate. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, blame wheat for it as much as I would blame all the changes that we've done to, um, in, in order to make things cheap, plentiful, and, um, and, and easy to control and make money out of an industrial model. That's right. what we've done. And um, when you, some of the things that you're talking about remind me of, of um, you know, when we were young, our... My, my mother would take me to uh, houses to expose me to um, chicken pox and everything. So we would get all these childhood diseases. And I think that research now is saying that when you have these childhood diseases, it strengthens and stimulates the immune system so that you can, are more resistant to more serious things later. Well, now we try to protect. It's the same thing you're talking about with your gut. You try to protect everybody and kill every germ. Now we have these hand cleansers at every every station that you, every corner almost, you are supposed to sanitize your hands. Well, maybe we need some of those um, uh, microbes coming in to form the microbiome of our gut to strengthen it. And we're sanitizing ourselves to death, <laughs> which is the, that's the greatest paradox, uh, I would say, that we're sanitizing ourselves to death. Um, this is really, um, in order to try to protect ourselves, we're actually making ourselves weaker. And um, it's, um, it, it, it happens on many fronts it, with parents who are overprotecting their children. They, instead of being stronger, they're, they're weaker and not able to cope with the adversity. And I think that, that you see this at many levels. And it's, um, it's maybe a little bit counterintuitive, but it's, if you look around in nature, you see it all the time. And uh, those are the lessons we should be taking and learning from. Cool. All right, and everyone, uh, you can get more information on, on Bob. You can go to his website and follow him on Instagram at Bob Quinn. It's Q U I N N organicfarmer.com. That's Bob Quinn, organicfarmer.com. Bob, great to have you back. Good luck with everything you're doing. Uh, we're big fans here. Thank you very much. It's great to join you again. You bet. Do you like this video? Don't forget to subscribe and share. 
This recording is brought to you by Life Spa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at lifespa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.